Having performed a thorough discussion of harmonic oscillator, now we move on uh, to another system rigid rotor. Now uh, rigid rotor, uh, well we will come to the rigid part later on, but rotational dynamics is something that once again all of us would have studied in class 11 physics uh, using classical mechanics. What we do is uh, we use the same concepts of classical mechanics, but rewrite it in the language of quantum mechanics to develop a treatment of uh, a rigid rotor, rigid rotor means whose length does not change while it rotates. And the reason why it is uh, interesting in our course is that a rigid rotor uh, is a good model for a diatomic molecule that is rotating. Let us say I have two molecules something like HCl, let us say H has mass m2, Cl has mass m1. Uh, the uh, distance of m1 from center of mass let us say is r1, distance of H from uh, center of mass is r2 and let us say their internuclear separation is capital R. So capital R essentially will be small r1 plus small r2. So let us consider this molecule rotating. How uh, do we uh, what kind of equations do we write? Uh, of course, since we are using uh, we are talking about molecules, we have to use quantum mechanics. When we use quantum mechanics, we have to uh, talk about wave functions and we have to use operators. That is what we learn in this uh, next couple of modules. Now, the first thing to do here, and this is something that we do in classical mechanics as well, is to reduce this two body problem to a one body problem. Because if you want to write uh, the equations of motions of two uh, bodies moving around each other, then uh, the equation has too many terms. It is much simpler if we consider uh, one body of mass equal to reduced mass. I am not writing the expression of reduced mass here, I think I have it somewhere later on, but in any case I am sure everybody knows it. The way I remember it very well is that 1 by mu is equal to 1 by m1 plus 1 by m2 and then you can uh, simplify it. So we can consider this reduced mass uh, to rotate around a center with a uh, radius of orbit of r0 and uh, this r0 is essentially the radius of gyration. Exactly the same uh, treatment as what we have done in one uh, in uh, classical mechanical treatment of rotational dynamics right. Uh, reduced mass is used to uh, go from a little more uh, complicated two body problem to a one body problem right. So that is where we start with. So uh, whenever we write mu in the uh, subsequent discussion uh, all I mean is uh, reduced mass. Another thing that we need to use here is a spherical polar coordinates. That is a departure from what we have been doing so far. We have been talking about x, y, z coordinates. Now uh, since the rot we are talking about rotation, rotation is essentially a change of angle. It is more convenient if we describe the same three dimensional space which we are more familiar uh, describing as x, y and z by r theta and phi. Okay, but please do not forget it is the same space we are talking about. Uh, for the benefit of those who might uh, be a little rusty or might not have studied uh, spherical uh, polar coordinates, we will just go through it quickly. So please look at this diagram here. Uh, what I have drawn is I have drawn the three Cartesian axes x, y and z. And now we will define the three coordinates r theta and phi. First of all let us say this is the point we are talking about. This point has let us say coordinates of x, y and z. Now if I join a line from the origin to that point we are talking about, that line when drawn outwards from the origin represents the position vector of the point and it is called r. Remember r is really a vector. Okay. 
for now we will work only with the magnitude. So, uh, r is going to be uh, ranging from 0 to infinity. So, r equal to 0 to infinity is not very difficult to understand. Uh, where can the point be? It can be at the origin or it can be on y axis or it can be on uh, well x axis or y axis or z axis for which one of the coordinates will be 0. But uh, then when it moves away from the origin then uh, the length of r will increase and it is uh, not very difficult to see what the relationship between r and x, y and z is. To start with we can say r square equal to x square plus y square plus z square, but uh, as we will see there are simpler relations. So, the first coordinate is actually a linear coordinate r, the distance from the origin of the point we are talking about. Next we talk about the angle between the z axis and the position vector. Position vector remember is the line joining the uh, origin with the uh, point right when you draw it outwards that is the position vector. So, the first question is what is the angle between uh, the z axis and the position vector that angle is called the azimuthal angle or theta right. Uh, these terms azimuthal angle and all uh, these are ancient they come from ancient uh, tr trigonometry uh, they have been used in uh, astronomy. Uh, so, this do not think that uh, they have used only here ok. So, first of all we have theta. So, what is theta let us say this is z axis and let us say this is the uh, position vector then the angle made between the z axis and the position vector this angle is theta right. So, that is what it is. Now, the reason why we have a, the picture of a globe here is this is something we are very familiar with. From our uh, childhood we have studied maps in geography and we have talked about latitude and longitude. Can you tell me if theta is uh, related to one of these two latitude or longitude? I will give you a moment to come up with the answer is theta latitude or is theta longitude? Actually theta is sort of uh, latitude the only difference is latitude is measured from equator up and theta is measured from the pole down. So, uh, that is the only difference difference in convention, but that is the azimuthal angle right. So, this is theta what is the range of theta theta goes from 0 to pi. Now, you can think that I start from here ok we go down go down all the way to pi who is stopping me from going the other way nobody is stopping you. But then there is a third coordinate which takes care of what happens when the, the uh, vector goes the other way that is why the convention is to limit theta to uh, the range 0 to pi r of course can go to infinity. Now, the third, com third coordinate might look a little more complicated, but it is really very simple once you understand it. Let us uh, see what it is. So, of course, it has to be uh, the uh, angular deviation from either x axis or y axis, but angular deviation of what? When we worked with the, uh, the uh, position vector, we had this advantage that uh, we had only two lines right z axis and position vector and we could define theta. Now, if you want to draw phi between say x axis and the same position vector that phi will uh, not be unique anymore right because uh, theta is already there. So, we should not go beyond x y plane theta is what tells us about angular deviation from z axis. So, we should only focus on x and y plane uh, well x y plane when we talk, try to define the third ang third coordinate the second angular coordinate. To do that what is done is you drop a perpendicular from the uh, point to the x y plane and then draw a line from the origin to that perpendicular of course, that line is going to be in the x y plane right. So, uh, in other words what we have done is we have taken a projection of the position vector in x y plane and uh, the angle between the x axis and the projection is called phi. Now, phi is allowed to go from 0 to 2 pi. Now, you understand there is no need for theta to also go from 0 to 2 pi it is enough if theta goes up to pi anything that goes uh, well beyond pi is taken care of 
by the phi value because phi goes a full circle. We return to our globe is phi related to latitude or longitude of course the answer is very easy to give now because latitude is taken the only thing that is left is longitude. So, this is uh, sort of longitude ok uh, phi is uh, the same as what you have studied in geography as longitude ok. So, it goes from uh, 0 to 2 pi. Now, uh, let us talk about the relationship between x y z Cartesian coordinates and r theta phi the spherical polar coordinates. First one is very simple z equal to r cos theta r is the length of the position vector if you drop a perpendicular from there this angle is theta you can see very easily that uh, this z is nothing but multi this hypotenuse r multiplied by cos theta right because theta is this angle using uh, the properties of right angle triangle you find out that z equal to cos theta or you might not even have to go that far back you can figure out very easily from your understanding of components and all ok. What about uh, x and what about y? For that we need the length of this projection of the uh, position vector that we had drawn in the xy plane. So, see the length of the projection I hope is not very difficult to understand is r sin theta because what we have done essentially is you have drawn a rectangle is not it. Starting from this point we had earlier dropped a perpendicular to z axis and from there we got this z equal to r cos theta. Now from here we have dropped a perpendicular here. Uh, so, what will be this length? Yeah. So, uh, the length of the projection is r sin theta I hope that is not very difficult to see this hypotenuse is r this angle is theta. So, the opposite side of course has to be r sin theta. Now what is x? x will be the uh, component of this projection along x axis length of this projection is r sin theta angle with x axis is phi. So, I hope it is not very difficult to understand that x is going to be r sin theta cos phi. Similarly, y is going to be r sin theta sin phi. These are extremely useful uh, relationships that we use all the time when we keep switching between Cartesian and spherical polar coordinates. Okay. The other uh, the inverse uh, relationships are I already told you r square equal to x square plus y square plus z square. So, r will be equal to square root of that. Now, uh, z equal to r cos theta. So, z by r equal to cos theta naturally theta is cos inverse z by r and how do you define phi? Well, you define this by dividing uh, x by y or y by x, y by x is a little better because then you get sin phi by cos phi that is tan phi. So, phi is naturally tan inverse y by x. So, if you know x y z you can figure out r theta phi, if you know r theta phi you can figure out x y z. They are uh, two different ways of looking at the same space essentially right, the same space in uh, two different languages you can think. Now, since we are talking about quantum mechanics the other quantity that we will need is the volume element. We have uh, you know we have uh, done normalization we have found out the probability and all. So, what is the volume element? If you work in x y z the volume element is very simple d x d y d z. When we work in spherical polar coordinates then what we have to do is we have to work with a volume element like this where you increase r by a small amount d r that is simple. Now, you increase theta by a small amount theta for that what you need to know is what is the length of this arc. What would the length of this arc be? Arc be? This length is r as we know and this small angle is d theta. So, the length of the r we can say is r d theta right r d theta. So, of this volume element the straight side is dr this curved side is r d theta. Similarly, the third curve side you can work out from the projection in the x y plane. Uh, what is this? This angle would be d phi and this length would be r sin theta remember r sin theta. So, r sin theta multiplied by d phi. So, what is the volume element? dr multiplied by r d theta multiplied by r sin theta uh, 
d phi. So, finally, we get d tau is equal to r square dr sin theta d theta d phi. This is something that will be very very useful when we talk about hydrogen atom especially we are going to revisit it at that time for now let this be a preview. Okay. So, uh, spherical polar coordinates is introduced now we want to uh, work with spherical polar coordinates. Why do we want to do it remember because we are talking about a rotating diatomic molecule a rigid rotor. So, in a rotation length does not change if it is a rigid rotor what changes is angle and we are not talking about rotation in a particular plane any rotation. So, any rotation means rotation uh, uh, will change in theta change in phi both has to be accounted for. So, what we now need to do is we need to rewrite the uh, rewrite Schrodinger equation in terms of r theta and phi. Okay. We are not going to do all of it whoever is uh, interested can go through the math what we will do is we will just show you the final result do you have to remember the final result not really. Okay. Uh, we will uh, tell you what you need to remember in fact you will see it for yourself uh, that part is uh, not so difficult to remember also. But remember uh, well I am saying remember too many times but I say it once more the emphasis on this of this course is not on remembering things but rather on understanding let us not uh, lose that focus. Okay, let us go ahead. So, what we will do is we know that uh, in uh, Schrodinger equation it is all about the Hamiltonian operator and Hamiltonian operator consists of two terms the Laplacian and the potential energy term Laplacian multiplied by some constant. So, uh, let us show you what the Laplacian looks like in spherical coordinates. Shall we work it out? No, we shall not. Why not? Because if you start from the relationship between uh, well it is written appendix 2 because I have copied it from some other presentation of ours and I was too lazy to change appendix 2 in uh, many slides. So, please bear with me on that, uh, but if you start from here and you keep on differentiating and try to change basis then uh, this is what you have to do something that we have summarized in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and 13 slides only in the 13th slide you get the result that is what we will work with. Okay. Please believe me right now that the Laplacian in spherical polar coordinates looks like this and whoever is uh, mathematically inclined is welcome to work it out. Great, but let us have a look at what we have in the Laplacian. We have three terms. The first term is purely in R 1 by R square del del R of R square del del R of psi. Okay. Well, this is not really the Laplacian because I have included psi also it is Laplacian operating on psi. Okay. So, you can just neglect the psi in the subsequent discussion. What is the second term? In the second term we have r we have theta two coordinates mixed and in the third term it is the worst we have 1 by r square we have sin square theta we also have del 2 del phi 2. So, what we have here is a uh, differential equation, but it is a partial differential equation in 3, three uh, variables. The way to go about solving this is to perform a uh, what is called a separation of variables. In hydrogen atom we have to start from here because r can change. In rigid rotor uh, the good thing is we have a little bit of advantage, but before that let me just show you the kinetic energy operator. If you remember kinetic energy operator is Laplacian multiplied by minus h cross square by in this case 2 mu. Why mu? Why not m? Because we have reduced the 2 body problem into a 1 body problem. So, we have to use reduced mass. Now, we are talking about a rigid rotor. So, one of these terms happily vanish to start with. Why? Because r is a constant remember and also uh, we do not even have to worry about potential energy. So, this Laplacian is all that is there in the Hamiltonian potential energy is 0 because you have a uh, reduced mass mu rotating about a, uh, a uh, massless center. So, the all the, the energy that is there is kinetic energy all right and that has uh, some implication that we are going to talk about later. So, potential energy is 0 and what I had started saying already jumping the gun is that uh, 
r is a constant. So, what is the consequence of r being a constant? We do not have to worry about the first term is not it? This del del r that does not arise anymore because r does not even change. So, if r does not change we do not have to worry about how the wave function changes as a function of r that is what del del r is is not it. So, uh, the derivative with respect to r vanishes we do not have to worry it anymore about it anymore. Also uh, what we have done in the next uh, slides is that instead of r here we have written r 0 just to remind us that this r is a constant value r 0 the bond length you can say or radius of gyration for a uh, rigid rotor. Okay. So, what would the Hamiltonian be in spherical coordinates? This is the Hamiltonian what we have written here minus h cross square by 2 mu multiplying 1 by r square sin theta del del theta of sin theta del del theta. I think I missed this bracket outside uh, sin theta del del theta in the previous slides, uh, but this is the right thing plus 1 by r square sin theta del to del phi 2 this is our Hamiltonian. In fact, uh, we can arrive at the Hamiltonian from a different starting point. Uh, for now, please take it axiomatically that the square of angular momentum operator is this. We are in the uh, one of the subsequent modules, we are going to talk in a little more detail about angular momentum because uh, there is one thing that we have been taking rain check on and that is a bit of formalism of quantum mechanics. So, uh, before going into hydrogen atom at least we should talk a little bit about formalism, we should talk about commutativity and uh, what happens when two operators commute and when they do not and we will also talk a little bit about angular momentum because it is a very very interesting uh, discussion and also the same angular momentum has uh, got to do with spin as well. Okay. But right now we are talking about uh, motion spherical uh, well rotational motion. For that let us start with angular any rotational motion will be associated with angular momentum. So, just believe me when I say that the square of angular momentum operator is minus h cross square multiplying 1 by sin theta del del theta sin theta del del theta again the sin theta del del theta is in brackets plus 1 by sin square theta multiplying del to del phi 2. Does that ring a bell? Have you seen it? I mean it would better ring a bell because we saw it just now in the previous slide it is just that this was multiplied by some constant right. So, this is L square. Now, let us remember what we know already from classical mechanics. What is the relationship in classical mechanics between uh, rotational kinetic energy and angular momentum? I think all of us would be able to say that the relationship is kinetic energy is equal to the square of angular momentum divided by 2 into i. What is i? Is the moment of inertia. Yeah. So, uh, rotational motion is sort of similar to linear motion, but the difference is uh, moment of inertia always replaces mass and angular momentum always replaces momentum. Otherwise, the relationship between uh, energy and angular momentum, kinetic energy and angular momentum in uh, linear motion is similar to the relationship between uh, kinetic energy of rotational motion and angular momentum. Right? So, kinetic energy is square of angular momentum divided by 2i. Knowing that and knowing the operator for L square, it is not difficult for us to construct the uh, operator for kinetic energy that would just be L square operator divided by 2i yeah L square divided by 2i that is L square by 2 mu r 0 square where now here I have written it this is a reduced mass m 1 m 2 by m 1 plus m 2 i is m 1 m 2 by m 1 plus m 2 r 0 square we write it simply as mu r 0 square. So, all I have to do to get the Hamiltonian in this case is I have to divide this L square operator by 2 mu r 0 square it is as simple as that. Let us do that 
what do we get? We get and now let us be careful and make sure that there is no mistake here minus h cross square divided by 2 mu r 0 square I am dividing by 2 mu r 0 square remember inside the bracket now let us be very very careful 1 by sin theta del del theta on del del theta of sin theta del del theta that I should have written the bracket here plus 1 by sin square theta del 2 del phi 2 this here is my Hamiltonian. Before trying to use this Hamiltonian uh, let us try to make it a little simpler because a partial differential equation where you have more than one uh, independent variable is uh, always solved or solved wherever it is possible by separating it into uh, individual differential equations in the different independent variables. That is why what I have done is I have written the constants in black and I have written the uh, terms in theta uh, this should have been written in blue as well terms in theta are in blue and the term in phi is in green ok. What we will try to do is we will try to uh, separate the variables in other words we are going to try and write equations in which uh, we will have only theta and no phi only phi and no theta and uh, those equations will be easy to solve. Let us take a break now we will come back and in the next module we will start from here.